Hi friends, so a while back I made a video about climate anxiety because I wanted to feel better and I also wanted you to feel better or at least I wanted us all to feel less worse. Problem is, I might have had the opposite effect. So I'm gonna assume if you're watching this video that you, like me, are very concerned about climate change but you, also like me, aren't that central to fixing it. We're not like the scientists in Don't Look Up, we're more of the Timmy Chalamets. Maybe we grew up recycling and watching Captain Planet. We compost, we Google brands before we buy things, but we don't not buy things. We're really, really scared about what's gonna happen, and lately we keep saying this thing about how 100 companies are responsible for 70% of climate emissions so that individual actions don't matter. But knowing that it's not our fault doesn't make us feel better. Somehow, it makes us feel worse. So in my last climate video, I talked about a book called A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety by Dr. Sarah Jaquette Ray, who's a professor of environmental studies. And a couple weeks ago, I decided to email Sarah and be like, help. I broke it, and uh, she agreed to talk to me about what matters when it feels like nothing matters. I was listening to some podcast with Mariana East Heglar, who um, is one of my favorite thinkers on this topic, and in it she said, you know, there was a time when all of the climate movement, you know, after an inconvenient truth, was all about changing light bulbs and driving a hybrid at some point or getting solar panels or just using canvas bags at the store. And those individual actions were kind of the sum total of the way people felt like they could intervene on the climate crisis. People had been given, so, had been sold a line that the number one way they can have power in this sphere is through their identity as a consumer and withholding consumerism or withholding dollars from a capitalist system instead of any other form of their identity having any power. The individualization of the problem is part of the problem. Now, as you just described, everybody's like, it's all structural, the problem is so big and it's connected to so many systems of power and the corporations have all this you know, control over our democracy. How do we unravel that? And whether I use this straw or not is really not gonna make a difference. So what's the point? I need to see evidence that my deprivation or my sacrifice or my lifestyle choices that go so against the grain of what's convenient for me is gonna make a difference, right? I mean, we, I understand that, right? There's a, there's, that's the way the argument has been framed. And we swung too far the other direction. And it's been framed as a kind of an either or. Of course, we can't just rely on corporations to fix all these problems. They haven't. It's not in their interest to do so. So there's, there's a lot of different solutions, uh, different kinds of theories of social change. I love to get geeky out and academic and you know, look at different theories of social change, like systems theory. Or um, I love Adrienne Marie Brown's work and emergent strategy. To, she talks about we're all like the, the, the ocean in a drop to suggest that small is all, small is good. It's the sort of rejection of, the, of what psychologists call the drop in the bucket imaginary. I have come to want to have a different motivation or a different rationale for why I should do those behaviors in my own individual life that's not based on having to see an outcome. And so I think about Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, she talks about practical reverence and the honorable harvest. Those conjure up really um, like an ethic of obligation to walk around in the world just doing the least harm to stuff as possible, as just an ethical gift you give to the world. You have to find some other reason to do it besides guarantee of an outcome. And here's where I look to past social movement leaders, Grace Lee Boggs, I.F. Stone, um, Martin Luther King Jr. They will all tell you, if you need, need to have an evidence of outcome, proof that your efforts are gonna make a difference, then you're not asking a big enough question. This notion that we can't affect change because we're too small is also in the interests of corporations. Capitalism, it strikes again, man. While the correction of the idea that we all should just reduce our individual carbon footprints and not really pay attention to who's holding the levers of power was necessary, we have to be careful not to overcorrect 
too far in the other direction and just feel like we have no power or responsibility at all. I think there's a lot of things that feel like insignificant individual actions that can actually be collective and powerful. So we have to find how to walk that line between total helplessness, but also the crushing guilt that can cause you to be unhelpful in other ways, like me in college fighting with my family over how sending Christmas cards was too wasteful. Or you could Doug Forsett your way into thinking that humans existing is inherently wrong. And the environmental and climate movements in general have been way too browbeaty, guilt-ridden, deprivation-oriented, you know, there's limited resources, stop sucking up more than your own. But in a different story of the climate movement that is about harnessing our feelings of sadness and despair about what we see around us to motivate action to build the world we want, then we're drawn by more carrot and less stick. Can we make an environmental movement that's about building something we desire and creating abundance? I think we won't be thinking about lifestyle choices as a kind of sacrifice or deprivation that we have to convince people to do, mm -hmm. right? Like people will do it because they want to. If I make these decisions, my life will be enriched. You know, if something you love is going to be threatened, you can turn into a cornered cat and do some behavior change. Right. And that might be useful. That's, you know, fear, fear tactics do have measurable effects on audiences. Anyone who studies neuroscience or psychology also knows that if you are constantly in that state, you burn out. And also from that space of being outside of what psychologists call the window of tolerance means that you're not necessarily reacting from a place of wisdom or skill. And you may not necessarily make decisions that are in the best interest of the climate. As validating as it was to hear Sarah talk about how these feelings of guilt and anger and despair are valid and kind of rational responses to what we're seeing in front of us, it's also just a lot to have hanging off your shoulders as you're just trying to do your life every day. So I wanted to figure out how we can counter that. I didn't ask Sarah what gives her hope because I've heard a lot of climate activists say that that's not like an original or helpful question at all. But I did ask her how we get up every day and keep dealing with this thing that feels so difficult and frightening. If you feel that the problem is so big and inevitable that there's nothing you can do to do anything about it, you are much less likely to actually try to do anything about it. Sociologist Kari Norgard has proven more Americans can imagine the apocalypse than they can imagine a post-fossil fuel society. Post-fossil fuel society is actually fairly likely, right? We're like on the way there. One could say it's an inevitable narrative. It's just slow, slower than we'd like, right? But, you know, if we can't imagine the world that we want to live in that's actually viable, and we're more likely to imagine the apocalypse, that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy because of the pseudo inefficacy effect which means that we just check out and don't even try. This problem is certainly not gonna get solved if I'm debilitated by the inevitability narrative and my lack of imagination about a post-fossil society. I should probably start cultivating an imagination about a world I want that's different than the apocalypse and better get to work. Hell, we have a lot of power as individuals. Depends on what you call power. Mm. You know, I mean, lots of people, you know, I'm thinking about different theories of power here. Talk about power with, power over. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of different notions of power. And if we think about power as only having a lot of money and we only think about power as something we can do as consumers, yeah, we're pretty limited. But there's power in so many domains of our lives, so many aspects of our identity. We have spheres of influence that we can map out anytime and just start engaging right away. We got power right in front of us. All the time. Yesterday, I was doing an interview with Jennifer Uchendo, who, who's a, um, a Nigerian climate activist, and she's the founder of Susti Vibes, which is in Nigeria. And she basically says, we need to reframe climate anxiety not as something that is scary and pathologized and that you should go to a therapist for or get self-care, do, do a bubble bath to deal with, mm -hmm. but rather as this really positive sign that we're connected to the world and we should harness it to like do great things. Like it's... I want more, she said, I want more people to feel climate anxiety. 
right? If more politicians felt climate anxiety, we wouldn't be in this position, you know? So there's a, there's a real, um, the first step there is to not have an aversion to uncomfortable feelings, which is very anti-American and very anti-capitalist, right? There are people who legitimately need like professional intervention. So I'm not talking about that, but there's a sense of um, pressure to uh, wear as almost a badge of, of, of credibility that you are um, sacrificing yourself in service of the cause, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a culture of that in activism and it's noble, you know, it's driven by a noble sense of urgency. Um, but it is another way that we walk around performing capitalism for it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, capitalism would love us to burn ourselves out fighting it. And in fact, the climate problems that we have will be around for our lives. There will never be a time when we stop being vigilant about this. It is a marathon, not a sprint. In fact, it's more like a marathon slash relay race because we can do it with other people. That notion of being a collective can release us from pressure too, right? The individualist, individualistic narrative that's underpinning that drop in the bucket imaginary that we're the only ones doing it and we have to burn the midnight oil to get that done and we'll do it until it's done. Well, it's never gonna be done. It's never gonna be done. Knowing that this will be the work of our lives. We have a choice to make. You know, Are we going to have a good time trying to do it? <laughs> or are we gonna suffer and maybe even check out. The story that's not told is how much we need our mental health to mitigate climate change. Imagine that we're doing this for our whole lives. So what's the pace we need to strike? In a way, it was comforting for me to hear that. Like, this does not go away. Not for the rest of our lives. We will be wrestling with climate change for the rest of the future, which means that, you know, those seven-year countdowns or doomsday clocks or whatever device people are using to try to get people to feel urgency about all of this is kind of irrelevant for us because we already feel the urgency every day. We're not working up to some hard deadline. There is not a comet that's going to strike. This isn't like a pass-fail exam situation. We're just already in it and we're not going anywhere. So what do we do from here? I usually like to end my videos with a question, something that you can tell me a story or share an idea about in the comments. So I asked Sarah what she wanted to see us talk about. And to be honest, she asked me this question over a week ago and I don't know if I have an answer yet. So I'll let her ask it. Well, I guess the question would be, what would it take to desire the future? The radish was too stunned to speak. I guess in all of my visions of the future, I hadn't ever considered that it could be better, that it could be something that felt good. Like there are things that will get uncomfortable, but are we comfortable now? Are we good now? Maybe there are some upsides to having to change everything. I'm excited to see your comments about what you think it would take to make the future desirable. And then how do we start to get there? This video is brought to you by the Radish Collective. I've also left a reading list of Dr. Ray's work and the work of all the folks that she mentioned in our interview down in the description. I'll see you soon. Bye.